All right, um, so it's good to be up here, you guys. It's good to see all of you here. Thanks for coming. Um, before we get started tonight, I wanted to do something a little bit different. Um, if, you've, if you've heard the news, Pastor Brian fell last night um, after preaching um, Wednesday night service um, at his house and broke his pelvis, I believe, in a couple of different locations in a very, very rare type of break. It sounds like there is some internal bleeding, but they thought it, that he was going to be okay, um, just fine. But that's just you know something that they definitely wanted to act on quickly. So as far as I know, he's already been transferred to a hospital in Santa Maria to see a specialist. And my guess is we'll probably be going into surgery pretty soon. Um, Monday? OK. So what I wanted this. Our, our families of the, the families of the pastors of our church have been through a lot recently. And I just wanted to ask, can you stand with me and pray for Pastor Brian and for Pastor Roger's family in general um, as, uh, as this is all going on? Father, we don't understand why um, things happen the way that they've happened and the way that they're happening. We lift up Pastor Brian to you right now after this this tough fall that he took. Um, we pray for, for wisdom and guidance with the doctors, the specialists that are going to see him. We pray that the surgery would go very well. We pray for a fast, but more importantly, a healthy recovery, and that you would get him back in that pulpit exactly when you want to. We pray for Pastor Roger and his continued re recovery from everything that he's been going through, and just God, just please be with that family right now and give them strength, give them endurance, and most of all, just help them to feel the goodness of God during these difficult times. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Okay, so tonight, turn with me in your Bibles, if you could please, to the Old Testament book of Habakkuk for a message that I'm calling A Blueprint for Dealing with Pain. If you get to the book of Matthew, Habakkuk up five books. Did you see what I did there? <laughs> yeah, it could be kind of funny, huh? Um, it's sandwiched between the books of Nahum and Zephaniah. Um, what, um, which, oh man, I'm going to butcher this, Monty. Which, uh, which prophet loves soda the most? Uh, Habakkuk? Uh, uh, Habakkuk. Habakkuk, man. Uh, see, this is what happened when I told the jokes. Anyways. Um, so the reason I'm preaching this tonight, Pastor Roger has preached a couple of messages on the book of Habakkuk that have really meant a lot to me. Um, and because of that, my class has been studying Habakkuk in the Vantage Point class for the last couple of months. So what you're going to hear tonight is kind of a culmination of those two inspirations. So I'm going to start out reading in Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. The burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw. O oh Lord, how long shall I cry, and you will not hear? Even cry out to you, violence, and you will not save. Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me. Their strife and contention arises. Therefore the law is powerless. Justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, and perverse judgment proceeds. Would you pray with me? Father God, I need you tonight. The burden of this message is, is deep. God, this is your message and not mine. Nothing that I say tonight will carry any sort of weight or relevance unless it's the power of God that's behind the words that I speak. God, tonight is a, it's a big topic. It's a topic of pain. And we need your message tonight. Show us who you are in the midst of pain, in the midst of trials, in the midst of suffering. And be with us as we study Habakkuk. In Jesus' name, amen. Horatio Spafford was a blessed man living a really, really good life. He and his wife, Anna, were very active at their church in Chicago. They were actually close friends with a famous evangelist named Dwight Moody. Horatio had a job as a lawyer, and because of that, the family was very wealthy. They had a lot of properties in Chicago. But most importantly, they were blessed with five children, one son and four daughters. Life was great for the Spafford family, and then tragedy hit. In 1870, the Spafford son, Horatio Jr., died of scarlet fever at just four years old. But the tragedy didn't stop there. In 1871, the Great Chicago Fire would sweep through, killing hundreds and leaving hundreds of thousands homeless, destroying many of Horatio's properties. 
But for two years, the Spaffords didn't give up. They did everything that they could to help those in need that were trying to recover from this great fire. They were still trying to do all the right things. And then came the fall of 1873, two years later. Horatio knew that his friend Dwight Moody was going to be preaching in England, and he thought, what a great opportunity for our family to vacation in England. But Horatio was held up with, family, or with his business, so what he did is he decided to send his wife and four daughters on a boat to travel across to England, and he would rendezvous, rendezvous with them later. On November 22nd, 1873, while crossing the Atlantic towards England, the steamship that was carrying Horatio Spafford's wife and four daughters was struck by an iron sailing ship. In just 12 minutes, the ship would sink, taking the lives of 226 people on board, including the four daughters of Horatio Spafford. Remarkably, Horatio's wife Anna was found alive, floating unconscious on a piece of wood. And once she reached South Wells, she telegrammed Horatio to tell him of the awful news with just two words, the telegram read, saved, alone. After being rescued, <clears throat> one of the surviving ministers who was on the ship and also survived heard Anna Spafford say this, God gave me four daughters. Now they have been taken from me. Someday I hope to understand why. <clears throat> if you could ask God anything, what would you ask him? I asked the Vantage Point class this a couple of months ago when we started the study, and overwhelmingly, the number one response that I got was some form related to the question of why. Why is there evil and wickedness in the world? Why is there pain? Why is there suffering? Why is there hurt? Why is there injustice? Why do bad things happen to good people? Sure, I think all of us that are Christians, that are saved, have, have learned how God can use suffering in our lives, that he can chasten us through suffering, that he can get us back on the right track, just like he did with Jonah. He can comfort others. Maybe today you're going through something that is going to help somebody else in your life down the road. But he also can use it to conform us, to mold us and to shape us into the person that he wants us to become. Someone once asked Michelangelo, the great sculptor, when he was sculpting David, how did you do it? And he said it was, it was easy. I just chipped away everything that didn't look like David. And that's what God is doing in our lives. He's chipping away everything that doesn't look like his son in an effort to make us more and more like him. But sometimes, and maybe you're there tonight, you're looking at me and you're saying that's not good enough. Maybe everything that I just said makes sense, but it's not helping. Maybe you're going through something tonight and you're not seeing the, the light at the end of the tunnel. The truth is that today, all around the world, people are dealing with pain and suffering in all the wrong ways, and they're looking for help in all the wrong places. Tonight, I want to look to the Bible for the answers to pain and suffering. I want to look to the one who holds the answers. Tonight, I want to dig deeper into the topic of pain, into the topic of suffering. I want to get down to the root question of why. To do so, we're going to look at the Old Testament book of Habakkuk. And guys, it's a book that was written 2,600 years ago, but it's highly contemporary in that it contains many of the same questions that you and, ask, you and I ask today surrounding the questions of why. Look with me at Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 1. It says, the burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw. This burden, or your translation could say oracle, this was a weighty or a, a heavy judgment that God would give the prophets to deliver judgment to the nation of Israel or the nation of Judah, that God was going to deliver some form of judgment or punishment on them. The oracle in this case that Habakkuk would see is Babylon is coming. Babylon is coming. We don't know much about the prophet Habakkuk. Some Jewish traditions teach that he's the son of the Shunammite woman who Elisha raised from the dead, which would be super cool. Um, not sure if we can confirm that with what we know from the Bible, but it's a cool thought. What we do know about him is this. He was one of 12 minor prophets, and he was a prophet to the nation of Judah. So there was once a United Kingdom that split into two, uh, the 10 tribes to the north or the nation of Israel, and then the two other tribes, which consisted of the, tribe, uh, the nation of Judah centered in Jerusalem. At this point, as we're talking, Israel had been wiped out by Assyria and only Judah remained. We also know Habakkuk was contemporary with another pretty famous prophet during this time named Jeremiah. He was contemporary with him in two different ways. One was he was a prophet at the same time of history. 
The second one, though, is he had the same message. The Babylonians, or the Chaldeans, as they would be called, are coming. For many years since he was a young boy, Jeremiah had been trying to warn the people of Judah that Babylon was coming to bring judgment to them. But the people held him in derision. They didn't, they didn't believe him. They mocked him. They made fun of him. They said, yeah, right. That's not going to happen to us. Years later, Jeremiah's prophecy would come true. And over a series of three exiles, King Nebuchadnezzar, some say one of the greatest kings ever in terms of sheer power, would conquer Judah in, over a series of three separate exiles. After these exiles and the attack on Judah, it left Jerusalem decimated. And Jeremiah would walk through weeping and mourning as he walked through the ruined city of Jerusalem, recounting his laments. And he wrote the book of Lamentations. We believe that the book of Habakkuk was likely written in these latter days of Jeremiah's ministry, but before the first Babylonian exile. The book has the same message as Jeremiah. Babylon is coming, but Habakkuk's book is much different than the book of Jeremiah and really most of the other prophets in a big way. Most of the prophets would address the nation on behalf of God, but Habakkuk addressed God on behalf of the nation. In fact, his book, it reads more like a conversation or a dialect between Habakkuk and God. It's a book of Habakkuk asking God two questions, and amazingly, God chooses to answer them. Scholars have interpreted his name different ways, but uh, one that I really like is the word struggler. Habakkuk's name means struggler. Pretty fitting if you think about it, because the theme of Habakkuk's questions to God were surrounding the question of why. It's not a book that deals with what is going to happen or when it's going to happen or how it's going to happen. It's a book that grapples with the thought of why is it going to happen. It's a book that deals with why is there pain, evil, and suffering? Why is there spiritual drift? Why do the wicked prosper and the good suffer? Why do bad things happen to good people? Why is there injustice in the world? To be honest, his book is a true form of a theological crisis. A.W. Tozer once said that what comes into our minds when we think of God is the single most important thing about us. And what Habakkuk believed to be true of God and to be true of the plan that God had for Habakkuk's life was under attack in the mind of Habakkuk. Maybe you're there tonight too. Maybe you're looking around at your life right now and you're going, this isn't the God that I thought he was. Or maybe you're saying, maybe this isn't the plan that I thought that he had for my life. What you believe to be true of God and his plan for your life doesn't match up with the way you think things should be. This theological crisis that Habakkuk had, which many of us might be going through tonight, is something called the problem of pain. C.S. Lewis wrote a book on this called The Problem of Pain, and he defined it as such. If God were good, he would wish to make his creatures perfectly happy, and if God were almighty, he would be able to do what he wished. But the creatures are not happy, therefore God lacks either goodness or power or both. This is the problem of pain. Habakkuk is a book that deals with the problem of pain. In other words, if God is truly omnipotent or he's all-powerful, and if God is truly good and all-loving, then why is there evil in the world? Can all three really exist at the same time? How could they? How could that be true? It's a question that puzzles not just Christians, but non-Christians as well. There is a rabbi in New York who explored this dilemma when he lost his son, and he wrote a book called When Bad Things Happen to Good People. It was a bestseller. And it started off in a great way. It was asking all the same questions that we're asking tonight that Habakkuk asked. Why is there evil? Why is there pain? Why is there suffering? But he came to the wrong conclusions. He couldn't grapple with the fact that there could be a, a God that was both powerful and good, and also the fact that there was evil in the world. He said that's not possible. And he couldn't let go of this thought of God being good, a loving father in his life. So he came to this conclusion that God sits up on his throne powerless and his heart breaks in a loving way for us as we go through suffering, but there's nothing that he can do about it. <laughs> what, a, what a terrible conclusion. That is the type of conclusion you come to when a finite being tries to describe an infinite God. As Christians, we know from the Bible that God is sovereign. He's in control. He's the supreme court of the universe. Nothing happens unless two ways. Either God wills it or he allows it. Not even a speck of cosmic dust is allowed to lift without his authority. 
We know he's all-powerful or he's omnipotent. From his very breath, all of creation came into existence. At the single utterance or snap of his fingers, all of creation's beckoned to him. At his command, nations rise and fall. At his command, in an instant, the wind and the seas obey him. There is God's creation. And transcending high above God's creation is the creator on the throne, ruling over all. There is us, the creation, and then there is him, the creator. We also know God is good. He's a gracious God. He's a loving God. He's a merciful God, an all-present God, an omnipresent God, a loving God, a shepherd who wants the very best for us and has a great and a perfect plan for our lives that we could never possibly imagine from his omniscience or his all-knowing. Jeremiah 29, 11, a pretty famous verse, maybe a life verse, certainly a verse you go to in suffering, says this, for I know the plans that I have towards you, declares the Lord, plans that prosper you and not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. So the question is this, if God is above all, and if he's over all, and if he's a loving God with a perfect plan for my life, then how in the world is there evil in this world? How could there be evil in this world? If God loves me, why would he allow me to experience pain and suffering? Enter the book of Habakkuk. This is the crisis that Habakkuk had. He was trying to sort out this problem of pain. And from Habakkuk's two questions and from God's answers, I think this book gives us a blueprint for how to deal with pain in our lives. Together, I want to look at this. And from the text, I want to show you what I believe to be five biblical ways that you can deal with this problem of pain. Let's start off by looking at Habakkuk's first question, which is, in, which is found in Habakkuk 1, chapter 2 through 4. He says, O Lord, how long shall I cry? You will not hear, even cry out to you, violence, and you will not save. Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? That's his first question. It can be summarized something like this. God, why is there evil and injustice in the world? That was Habakkuk's first question to God. God, why is there evil in my life and in the world around me? And why does it go unpunished? Have you ever asked that question before? Can you relate to that question? He describes what he's seen in the culture or the world around him. He says, violence is one of the strongest Hebrew words reserved for the worst of crimes. He says iniquity or immorality or ungodliness. He says he sees trouble. He sees plundering or theft before him. Strife and contention are all around him or angry disagreements. Sounds familiar. Remember, the oracle that Habakkuk got or the burden was that Babylon was coming. But I don't think he's describing the culture of Babylon with his first question and his first cry. I think he's talking about his own people, the people of Judah. A little historical background. The days of the United Kingdom under King David and Solomon were over. And like I said, now they split into the 10 tribes to the north or Israel and Judah centered in Jerusalem. Assyria wipes out Israel and only Judah remains. And for years, King Hezekiah revolted against the Assyrian Empire holding them off. He was one of the good guys. He was one of the good kings of Judah. But unfortunately, most of these kings of Judah were not so good. And 2 Kings 2.21 tells us nobody was worse than the son of Hezekiah, Manasseh. Under Manasseh would be one of the greatest times of wickedness in Judah. He would rebuild all the altars and the high places to Baal that his father, Hezekiah, had torn down. He'd bring in the idols and the false gods from Assyria and the neighboring nations. He offered his own son as a burnt sacrifice to the false god, Moloch. He turned Solomon's temple into a storage unit. For 50 years, there was great spiritual famine in Judah. But then a sign of hope came in the form of a young boy who became king named King Josiah. The Bible says he began to seek after God. Josiah would go and tear down all of the altars and all of the high places to Baal that Manasseh had put up. He would purge all of the false idols and false gods from the land. In 621 BC, he ordered that the temple be cleaned out. And while they were cleaning, remember Manasseh turned it into a storage unit. While they were cleaning it out, they found a copy of the law, which people have interpreted to be the book of Deuteronomy. And as Josiah and the people read the book of Deuteronomy, they experienced tremendous spiritual revival. These were the best of times to be living in Judah, the times of spiritual prosperity. But sadly, years later, King Josiah would die in battle, and it all went downhill from there for Judah. It was during these years that many kings would be put on the throne of Judah, and all of them were controlled from these other 
nations, these ungodly nations. And it was during this time that Judah fell back into the days of Manasseh. All these halters and high places were rebuilt and these, these false gods were reintroduced. It was a terrible time once again of wickedness in Judah, a terrible time of spiritual famine. Why do I say all that? Because that is the Judah that Habakkuk was living in. We think Habakkuk wrote this book sometime between Josiah's death and the first Babylonian exile, maybe during the worst spiritual famine that Judah had been in. So when Habakkuk is asking God, why is there evil and injustice in this world? He's describing the society of his own people, the society of Judah. Part of also why we know this is Habakkuk 3.2 says, O Lord, revive your work in the midst of your years. He's asking God to return the nation of Judah to the days of Josiah, to the days of spiritual revival. So Habakkuk is looking around at his culture and he's saying, God, why is there evil? Why is there pain? Why is there injustice? God, your law, it's not working. It's powerless. Why did the bad go unpunished? God, why won't you do something? God, why won't you stop this? Be kind of like us looking around our society and saying, God, what is going on in America? Why do people treat me cruelly? Why is there sexual immorality? Why is there abortion? Why is there abuse? Why is there pain? Why does evil just run rampant as it pleases? God, why won't you stop this? Blueprint number one to deal with pain is this. We need to pursue God. Look with me in uh, verse two of chapter one. It says, O oh Lord, how long will I cry? And you will not hear. That phrase, how long shall I cry, is used often in the Psalms by the psalmist to express deep thoughts of perplexity. In other words, yes, it was a prayer, but it was more of a cry of distress to God. This was a prophet with a broken heart who was crying out to God. When you hit rock bottom, it's pretty important who you're talking to. Some people believe that it's not okay to, to question God. But I think Habakkuk is showing us here that there's a difference between complaining about God versus bringing your complaint to God. I think he shows us it's okay from a genuine heart to ask God why. Because when we ask God why, it assumes that he is and that he has a perfect plan that's above us that maybe we just can't understand, but we know that it's there. When you don't understand what's going on in your life, you should be talking to God about it. Wearsby said that what we always need in times of doubt is a new view of God. When we ask God why from a genuine heart, I think what it does is it produces a renewed view of God in our lives from our cry out of distress and our conversations with him. But maybe you're looking at this and you're like, uh, hold up, Ben, you missed something. We get the feeling that Habakkuk had been praying for years and he's not answering him. He says, how long will I cry and you won't hear? Have you ever felt like God doesn't answer your prayers? Sometimes it just feels like he isn't listening, maybe. You ever felt that before? But just because God doesn't answer our prayer doesn't mean that he's not listening. Did you know that God knows the number of hairs on your head? He knows every beast and bird of the air. He's numbered and named the stars. He's measured the water and all the oceans by his hands. He's calculated the dust of the earth. He's weighed the mountains and scales and the hills and the balance. Acts 15 tells us that God knows all. He's the omniscient one. He's the all-knowing one. Guys, the truth is this. God has already heard, seen every prayer you will ever have. Every thought you would ever produce, he's seen it. Let me read you something from Psalms 139. O oh Lord, you've searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought from afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O oh Lord, you know it altogether. You have hedged me behind and before and laid your hand on me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain it. For reasons that I don't truly understand, God does not always decide to answer our prayers. But let me share you something from my favorite author, A.W. Tozer. He said this, God is not silent. It is the nature of God to speak. And the Bible is the inevitable outcome of God's continuous speech. It's the infallible declaration of his mind. Guys, we have unlimited access to the words of Jesus, to the words of our Father, right here in his holy word. When you feel like God is not answering your prayers, yes, keep crying out to God but get busy pursuing him in his word. So Habakkuk's been praying for years and years, and finally, God chooses 
to answer him, and his answer is about to blow Habakkuk's mind. Let's look at Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 5 through 6. It says this, Look among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded, for I will work a work in your days, which you would not believe, though it were told you. For indeed, I am raising up the Chaldeans, a bitter and a hasty nation which marches through the breadth of the earth to possess dwelling places that are not theirs. God answers not the question of why, but the question of what are you doing about it. God says, okay, Habakkuk, you asked me for judgment. You want me to do something about it? Well, I am doing something about it. I'm, at, I'm raising up the Chaldeans to judge you, to judge Judah. God doesn't give Habakkuk an explanation. He gives him a revelation. Habakkuk, do you really think it's an accident of history that Babylon has come to power at this exact time? God says, I've been raising them up to judge you. Listen to how God describes the Babylonians. I'm not going to read the text. This is like the rest of um, uh, 1 through, um, ver through verse 11, I believe. But let me just kind of explain how God describes the Babylonians to Habakkuk. Starting in verse 7, he says they're terrible and dreadful. Their horses are faster than leopards. They're, they have the stamina of evening wolves that are up all day and hunt for food all night. Their troops swoop down on their prey like vultures. Their armies sweep across the land like the wind. They worship false gods and they worship their own strength. Their only purpose in life is to cruelly enslave and conquer nations. This was an evil, wicked, wicked nation. Sounds a little harsh, doesn't it? Clearly not the answer Habakkuk was looking for. And it leads to his second question. Look with me in Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God? My holy one, we shall not die. Lord, you've appointed them for judgment, O rock. You've marked them for correction. You're a purer eyes than to behold evil and cannot even look on wickedness. Why do you look on those who deal treacherously and hold your tongue when the wicked devour is a person more righteous than he? Why do you make men like fish of the sea, like creeping things that have no ruler over them? Let me summarize Habakkuk's second question this way. Why is evil rewarded and good suffers? Habakkuk says, but God, Babylon, they're worse, they're worse than we are. How could you use evil to judge us? I mean, sure, we've been wicked, but how could you use a more wicked nation of Babylon to judge a less wicked nation of Judah? God, why is it that evil triumphs? Why is it that bad things happen to your people? Habakkuk's mind is blown. This is not the answer he was looking for. And as he's trying to really cope, even after he asks this question, he winds up giving a defense to God. He gives him three points of defense. We just read the first one, which is the character of God. He describes, just like Jonah did, um, he describes the character of God right back to him. Tells him something he doesn't know, right? He says, oh, Lord, you're from everlasting. You're the holy one. You're our God. We're not going to die. You're the rock. You're our rock. You've marked them for evil. You've marked Babylon for correction. You're so pure, you can't even look at evil or wickedness. He says, God... Don't you understand, like, who you are? He just repeats it right back to him. And then he says, the helplessness of Judah. He says, God, we're doomed. We stand no chance. This is his second defense. He says, God, Judah's doomed. We're all going to get caught up in their dragnets. And the third point of defense he gives is he reminds, reminds God of the ruthlessness of Babylon. He says, Habakkuk, these people are bad. They trust in their own military might or their net, depending on your translation. They worship false gods. They're puffed up in their own arrogance and self-confidence. God, how could you honor this behavior and allow it to happen? How could you fill their nets with victims? I think it's important to understand here, and I really hope that, that this comes through, that there's a difference between doubt and between unbelief. Unbelief is a refusal to accept. Doubt is a broken heart. In a troubled mind. And I think what you're seeing here with Habakkuk is not an, an unbelief or refusal to accept. I think you see a broken heart and a troubled mind that's just trying to understand the plan of why. When storms or difficult situations come into our lives, I think that's kind of how we feel sometimes is God, okay, this doesn't make any sense to me, but just fill me in on some of the plan. Just give me like 1% of it. Just give me something just so I, so I can have hope so I can have faith that you really are in control of this whole thing and you really do have a perfect plan for my life. Just show me part of it. Show me part of the plan. I think that's what Habakkuk's doing here and that's what we often sometimes do as well. Blueprint number two for dealing with pain is this. We need to consider the bigger picture. Verse five, God says, look among the nations and watch. 
God says, Habakkuk, I'm at work among the nations. Do you really think that this is just about you or just about Judah or just about Babylon? God, or Habakkuk, God says, this is, this is about my greater plan for the entire universe. Habakkuk couldn't see it at this point. They were about to go into exile. But hundreds of years down the road in the days of Esther would be the great diaspora as the Jews would be scattered across the earth, perfectly positioned to receive and transfer and take to the nations the message of Jesus. You see, guys, God has a kingdom agenda. He's the master planner. And as the master planner, he has purposes that he's determined to fulfill in history. And what's pretty cool is he uses you and I to partake in those purposes. That means your life, my life, is attached to not just something within myself, but a greater purpose, the, the purpose of the kingdom of God. And let me make this very clear. Nothing can stop God from accomplishing his purposes. Yes, there's evil in the world for reasons we don't understand ever since the fall. And let me be very clear, God cannot create evil. He does not create evil. But what we do know is this, like for example, he did not create this evil, wicked people in the Babylonians to wipe out his people. That was an attack by Satan. But what we do know is this, is that how his plan works, it's kind of like a funnel that just gets narrower and narrower as time goes on, that somehow, some way, he's going to work it all for good. He's going to take all the evil in the world, and he's going to take all the good in the world, and nothing will stop him from accomplishing his purposes, and he will work it all for good. In the end, he will win. Every second that goes by brings the universe closer to the truth that God will fulfill his kingdom agenda. But Habakkuk is still stuck in struggle land. He's still trying to figure out the question of why. And at this point, I think he's a crazy man. Look at chapter 2, verse 1 with me. Habakkuk says, I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart. The rampart was the temple mount or the, um, the top of the temple wall. And he says, I will watch to see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I'm corrected. So basically, what he does is he's very intentional, and he climbs to the top of the temple, and he sits down, and he says, God, I ain't moving until you give me an answer. I'm not moving until you answer my plea. And in verse 2, God says, okay, I'll answer you, Habakkuk. Verse 2 says this, Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision, make it plain on tablets, that he may run who reads it. He says, okay, Habakkuk, I'm going to answer you, but I'm going to answer you one time, and you better get it. And I want you to put it on the billboards. Make it so obvious that anyone running by couldn't miss it. Make it so easy to understand that anyone could read it and understand the purpose of what it means. God would give his second answer to Habakkuk's questions. And it's found in verses 3 through 4. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. This is chapter 2, verses 3 through 4. But at the end it will speak. It will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just will live by faith. God's second answer to Habakkuk's questions is this. The just will live by faith. That's it. The just will live by faith. God doesn't answer the question of why because it's too complex for us to understand. It was too complex for Habakkuk to understand. Pastor Roger once said, how could we possibly understand the complete narrative or flow of humanity? It's like a, it's like a little child that asks her daddy, why daddy, why is this happening? He says, because I said so. And she says, but why daddy, why daddy, why? He says, because I said so. To be honest, if you knew God's full step-by-step -step plan for your life, chances are pretty high that you wouldn't like it. His ways are high above ours. Isaiah 55, 8 through 9 says this, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. God operates in this dimension that we can't fully understand that often holds the answer to the question of why. He's the master planner who has this vantage point over our lives that we can't see, feel, touch, or fully understand. It brings us to our third blueprint, which is this. To deal with pain, you need to have faith in the master planner. When God said the just will live by faith, he changes Habakkuk's question. He changes the question from why to what is my response supposed to be. Yes, God is good, God is great, but there is evil in the world, and how in the world am I supposed to deal with that? The just will live by faith. That's it. When we don't understand the plan, 
we need to trust in the planner. We want reasons for why when we should be looking for results. We want purpose when we should be looking for the benefit of what could be going on in the world that I can't understand that is working towards God's kingdom agenda. What could he be up to? You guys, most books on suffering are completely worthless because they try to answer the question of why. Faith is when you stop looking for reasons and you start looking for results. We don't need to be filled in on God's plan. We just need to trust that he's the perfect master planner with an awesome plan for our lives. It's such a simple verse, the just will live by faith. Six very simple, easy to read monosyllables. That means one syllable words. But this simple phrase holds more meaning to history than you'll know. Warren Wearsby called it the most important monosyllable phrase in church history. Pastor Roger called it perhaps the greatest verse of the Old Testament. And the reason for that is because Paul and the writers of the epistle would use this as the backbone of their argument for explaining the message of Christ. I want to show you very quickly where you can find Habakkuk 2.4 in the New Testament. It appears three times, each time with a slightly different emphasis. The first time it shows up is in Romans chapter 1, verse 17. Romans 1.17 says, For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. The emphasis here is on the word just. And Paul is using it to explain salvation by justification through this thing called imputed righteousness. The Scala Sancta is a 28-step staircase in Rome that was brought over from none other than the palace of Pontius Pilate. And it's believed that Jesus, dripping in blood, walked up those exact stairs on his way for his final trial before he was ordered to be crucified. It's believed in the Catholic tradition that if you ascend each of these 28 stairs on your knees, praying a prayer on each step that you can earn indulgences for yourself or for your family. And the tradition, uh, the Catholic tradition taught something like this, that there's those of us that have more righteousness than we need, that there's those of us that have done a little bit better than we needed to do to earn our own salvation. And there's those of us that have done a little bit not enough. We've fallen short of the good works that we need to do to, own our own, to, to earn our own salvation. And the Pope had the ability in their belief to use indulgences to tra take some righteousness from someone that had too much of it and transfer it to someone that didn't have enough. That's indulgences. So there is this belief that if they earn these indulgences that they would lessen their time in purgatory. Well, years ago, there was this monk, you might have heard of him, from Germany who visited these stairs named Martin Luther. And it said that as Luther was ascending up each one of these stairs of the Scala Sancta, he had a verse stuck in his head, and it was old Habakkuk in Romans, the just will live by faith. It's said that he got up, he rose, he went back to Germany, he went back to Gettenberg, he penned the 95 Thesis, and it sparked the Great Reformation across Europe. Because of this, those words in Habakkuk 2.4 are called the watchword of the Reformation. Luther attributes his salvation to this change in heart that he had from this verse. It meant much, much more to Luther than you know. Luther said this, I was born again of the Holy Ghost, and the doors of paradise swung open, and I walked through. Luther would interpret this word, this word righteousness in the Greek as the Greek word dikaios, which means to count as righteous. He called this type of righteousness justitia alienum, or an alien faith, that our salvation is not based on our own righteousness or anything that we do, but on the righteousness of Christ. And when we put our faith in him, his righteousness is accounted for as our own before God. Luther understood exactly what Paul was trying to say in Romans. This verse that we read, Paul's been building this case that the whole world is guilty before God, that there is none righteous, there is no not one, there's no one that does good before God, that all of us fall short, that there is nothing that you can do on your own, there's no righteousness that you can attain on your own, there's no good works that you can build up to enough on your own to stand righteous before God. Instead, we're made righteous before God based on the imputed righteousness of Jesus in our lives. That word impute, it's an accounting term. You see, before salvation, all of us are spiritually bankrupt. Our righteousness is filthy rags. But when we believe in Jesus and we receive salvation, he transfers or he imputes his righteousness into our account so that we can be counted as righteous before God. 
So how are we saved? How are we made right before God? It's by this alien faith, by the righteousness of Jesus. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 says, For by grace you're saved through faith. It's nothing you do yourself. It's the gift of God, lest any man should boast. Let me move on to the second time this shows up in the New Testament. Galatians 3.11. It says, But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. This time it's not emphasize the word, emphasizing the word just, it's emphasizing the word live. Paul is using this text from Galatians to explain the concept of sanctification, which is not about our way to God, that's salvation, but our walk with God, that's sanctification. How do you live your Christian life? It's not in the keeping of rules or trying to do the best that you just can to squeak by or relying on your own puffed up strength like the Babylonians did. Instead, you should live your life by faith. The Christian life is lived by faith and personal connection to God. That's it. Hebrews 10.38 is the third time this shows up. It simply says, the just, but the just will live by faith. This time the emphasis is on the word faith. And the author of Hebrews, you might know what chapter comes next. It's Hebrews chapter 11. It's one of the most uh, famous, I'd say, chapters of the New Testament. The Hall of Faith. And the Hall of Faith records the commendable, commendable faith of many people in Bible history, right? But none of them did anything worth remembering in this life unless it was under the power of God that was behind them. It wasn't anything they did. What was commendable was their great faith in Christ and the power of, and the work of God in their lives. So not only is, is Habakkuk 2.4 used to explain the backbone of salvation, it's also used to explain sanctification, and it's used to introduce this hall of faith. It's used as the backbone of great faith. Blueprint number four, hope in the victor. How do we deal with pain? Hope in the victor. And I've got to be honest, you guys, I skipped this. I didn't catch this when we were studying this in my class. We've been in it for eight weeks. I totally, totally missed this. It blew my mind when I heard it. And I hope it's life-changing for you, too. Habakkuk 2.3. Habakkuk, let me put it this way. Habakkuk 2.4 is not possible without Habakkuk 2.3. And it's so easy to miss it. Verse 3 says this. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak. And though it will not lie, though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. God tells Habakkuk, the visions for an appointed time. It will surely come. Wait for it. It will not tarry. The rest of Habakkuk chapter 2 is God announcing his woe to the wicked or his victory over Babylon. But what he's telling Habakkuk is you don't know when it's going to happen, but it's going to happen. It will surely come. Habakkuk, it's only for a time I know, but wait for it. It will not tarry. Let me share something with you that you might not know about that verse I read at the beginning of the sermon, Jeremiah 29.11, a life verse probably for many people in here. I'll read it again. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope in a future. Do you want to know the context of when that verse was written? That verse was written from God had Jeremiah write it, to the people of Judah after they had already been captured and exiled and were living as prisoners in the land of Babylon. That verse, I know the plans I have for you, he sent that to them when they were in exile. What he was telling them is victory is coming. Habakkuk and the Jews in the Babylonian exile would ask, will the Lord ever come to deliver us? The Lord's answer was, yes, wait for it. There was once this world-class swimmer named Florence Chadwick. She had swam open ocean across the English Channel, and now she set out to accomplish the 26-mile trek from the Catalina Island to the California coast. And she jumped in the water, a number of boats around her. It was a foggy night, and she couldn't hardly see her own hand in front of her face. She swam for 15 hours and 55 minutes, but then she waved at the boats and she said, I quit, I give up. They got her up in the boat and they asked her why she quit and she said, the fog, it's just too thick, I can't, I can't see. But once she got on the boat, her heart sank because from that vantage point, she realized she was only a half mile from the California coast. Two months later, Chadwick would try it again. She got in the water and it was a beautiful day out, sunny, not a cloud in the sky. But after a while, once again, it got foggy. This time, the story says it was more foggy than the first time. But this time she kept swimming, and she wound up beating the world record by two hours. 
And she, when she arrived on the California coastline, one of the reporters asked her, last time you tried this, you quit. How'd you make it this time? Let me read her answer. She said, this time it was easy because I kept a mental picture of the California coastline in my mind. As long as I don't lose sight of where I was going, I could handle the trip and getting there. Florence Chadwick found hope when she looked ahead to the finish line. There was recently a quote, you probably heard it, that Pastor Andrew shared, that man can live 40 days without water, eight days without food, but not a second without hope. For the Christian, how can we live by faith? We can live by faith because we have hope. This verse, Habakkuk 2.3, is also quoted in the New Testament, and this is what I missed. It's found in Hebrews 10, 36 through 37, right before the other verse, 10, 38, that introduces the hall of faith. And it says this, For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. I don't know if you caught it, but the writer of Hebrews did something interesting. He switched the text of Habakkuk 2, 3 from it will come to he will come. He will not carry, tarry. This promise that God gave to good old Habakkuk years and years ago that someday Judah would be delivered over Babylon was used to explain the prophecy of something far, far, far greater in the grand scheme of God's plan. It was used to explain the return and prophesy the return of Jesus. Guys say we don't hope in one who was alive and is now dead. We hope in one who was dead and is now alive. Jesus has defeated death on the cross. We just celebrated Easter and he rose again a lot, giving us a chance, giving us a hope and a future. But someday Jesus is coming back again. This time he's going to rule as king to finish off evil once and for all. I'm going to read my favorite Pastor Roger quote to you now. I've read the back of the book and I know how it ends. In the end, Jesus wins. For the Christian, in the end, we win too. Friends, we should be careful to not exchange what we don't know for what we do know. Because what we do know is this. Nothing can stop Jesus from coming. Nothing can stop Jesus from winning. And nothing can stop you or can stop me from partaking in that victory. The writer of Hebrews says, wait for him. He will surely come. I don't know what you're going through today, but what I can tell you is this. If you're a Christian, hope will always be on the horizon. Today, maybe you're dealing with a tough breakup. Wait for him. Jesus will not tarry. Maybe you're in a tough situation at work. You're in a t there's a tough coworker. Maybe at school, it's a tough professor or class. Wait for him. He will not tarry. He's promised. Maybe you're dealing with a physical ailment or a sickness. Wait for him. Jesus will not tarry. Maybe you're grieving the loss of someone that you love today. Wait for him. He will not tarry. Jesus is coming. This is why you and I can have faith, because we have eternal hope in Christ. The final blueprint is this, and we're going to close the sermon on this point. Praise the Lord. How do we deal with pain? Praise the Lord. The first two chapters of Habakkuk are Habakkuk asking God these two questions and God answering him, and Habakkuk just trying to understand why. Well, after God's second answer, the just live by faith, comes chapter 3. And it's actually Habakkuk's response. And you see a heart that is just so overjoyed. And you see one of the greatest psalms in the Old Testament from the mouth of Habakkuk in Habakkuk chapter 3. I encourage you to go read it. It's an incredible, incredible psalm. But I want to read for you the end, how this book ends. In verses 17 through 18 of Habakkuk chapter 3, it says this. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Habakkuk says, and yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Horatio Spafford had just received a pretty awful telegram that his four daughters had passed away. 
and you set out across the Atlantic to be reunited with them. Oh, hello, there we go. He set off across the Atlantic to be reunited with them. And during the voyage to meet up with, uh, with Anna, they would come to a certain place on the sea. And the captain called Horatio up to the bridge. And he pointed to a place in the ocean and he said, we think that's the place where the ship went down, where your four little girls perished. After taking the moment in, Horatio returned to his cabin. He picked up his pen and he began to record the following words. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrow like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. <clears throat> 